Hello, this is R. Rats with Lesson 008 of my program, and we're going to pick up a little bit where we left off with Lesson 007. Uh, I brought back the position of the second game I showed in that event, and I'll give you the little backstory on this. I was in touch with one of my students in the meantime, and he explained to me he has identified his weaknesses as tactics and impulsivity. And I'll have a little bit to say about both tactics. He's going to study a lot of tactics. There's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, if you're on ICC, they have training bot. If you're anywhere else, you can pretty much find a uh, resource. Chess.com has their tra tactics trainer. They're free uh, uh, problems on the internet. You just search for them. They're there. Uh, nothing wrong with practicing your tactics. I don't recommend you play a lot of blitz and bullet. But if you do, this will help sharpen your tactics, especially when your opponent is tactical and starts playing them against you. You're going to learn them, and you're going to learn to look out and prevent them. All right, the other thing about tactics I thought was kind of funny. Uh, it reminded me of a famous uh, press conference that NBA former NBA basketball star Allen Iverson had about practice. And he's going on about practice. We're talking about practice. And I went and found the video. It's real easy to find. Just search Allen Iverson practice and you'll find it. It's, it's just a couple minutes. It's worth, worth a laugh, worth looking at. But what you do is just substitute the word practice and put in tactics. We're talking about tactics. <laughs> and, and for the most part, it kind of fits. Uh, he's saying he doesn't want to practice and they shouldn't make a big deal about it. He'll play when it counts in the game. And, you know, tactics are a big deal and you do have to have some kind of training in it. And I've maintained in this course, your best course of action to learn tactics is to examine your own games and, and you will uncover the tactics, much like I did in Lesson 004 when I demonstrated the, the winning combinations I had no matter how black played so whatever for what it's worth tactics is a good thing to study if you have time okay impulsivity was his other weakness what's that mean you're acting on impulse and it's a weakness of my own uh, and it, it apparently is a weakness of a lot of players uh, just give you an example if you look at some of the games I've uh, done commentary for for Team 4545 League and there's a link in this video to the thread where they're all found. Uh, I've seen several players playing moves on impulse. They see uh, a, a good looking move and if, if uh, your opponent does what you want you have a really fine continuation. And some of these moves are just impulse moves. They're tactical moves that come from a blitz player's mind. In blitz you're you're playing to uh, try to win tactically if you can, and if you can't, you'll try to win on time. And if you can put your opponent under defensive pressure, chances are he's going to uh, spend a little more time than you. If you go down to an ending with a 10, 20 second time advantage, that's enough time usually to win the game. If it's a, if it's a draw, you can just keep playing and keep playing, and eventually he runs out of time and can't claim the 50 move rule. So. But in real slow chess, uh, impulsive moves are punished. And if you make them, uh, you've got to look at the reasons why you make them and think about uh, avoiding making them. And I'll try to give a few, a few hints and suggestions before I get into that. Uh, I just want to stop and let you look at this position I brought back for a second. This is at the moment uh, where we went into a night end game. And I'll quiz you here if you've test your memory from when you saw Lesson 007. And my question is, do you recall the impulsive move that I played in as black? Now, I didn't play it here. It's Right now, it's white's move. So, let's see if you can find it. Okay? Okay, you should have restarted the video. If you haven't found it, I'm going to give you a clue. I'm going to get a little closer to it. And then... Uh, we'll see what happens. Okay, this is where I played my impulsive move. Do you remember what it was? Pause the video. Okay, you've resumed and here's my impulsive move. And as I explained, I played that move hoping he'll take it. I mean, it's great. Well, we want him to take that. Look at that. Knight takes pawn. He's got a couple of isolated uh, pawns and 
uh, my three pawns uh, left are all in great shape. Uh, I'm going to get my draw really easy here. But what happened was he didn't oblige me. Now he pushed by g5. Now h5 is kind of weak. At some point I'm probably going to have to guard it. And then and there I guarded it r right away. And suddenly I had this hole on f6, which I called my second weakness. The other being the fact he could create an outside pass pawn. And if he can get his king into f6, it's going to just be threatening to take that f7 pawn and, and run his uh, f pawn up the board. And, and he wins. So... Let's talk about it, impulse again. What causes it? Uh, a lot of times it's just impatience. Uh, some of the reasons you're playing a weaker player uh, and you've got a winning position and you, you think he should resign. You know, you're saying, well, if I had his position, I would resign. Why is he playing? Well, he's still playing. He has that right. And you've got to call on your inner strength and just slow down, take a breath, have a glass of water, walk around the room, uh, whatever. Just sit down and use your time wisely and find the, the correct move. And a lot of times the way to find the correct move is through proper uh, evaluation of the position through choices of candidate moves. In other words, you've got to be considering uh, several moves that you could make, not just writing with the first choice that comes to your mind and hoping that your opponent will go into that variation. Because, I mean, if you look back at this position, just a couple moves ago, when you play a silly move like h5, you're just telling your opponent, gee, I want you to take. And white says, well, what happens if I take? So white says, okay, if I take, he takes. Now what do I do? Ugh. Look at those ugly isolated pawns. I don't want those. I don't want those at all. Uh, and no way does he go into what you want. So instead he says, well, what else can I do? Well, white would say a candidate move is to play h3 or g5. And he's going to decide between the two of those, and that's exactly what he did. He decided to keep the pawns on the board and push g5 and see what happens. Okay, uh, another side point I'd like to make. There's a book, I'm sure it's still in print somewhere. Actually, it's a series. It was written by Grandmaster Alexander Kotov. And just the title in itself uh, will, will sell a lot of books. It's called Think Like a Grandmaster. Uh, I don't know what the original Russian title for it was, but that's how it was translated in America when it came out in the early 1970s. And everybody was going out and buying it. And his subsequent uh, follow-ups were Play Like a Grandmaster and Train Like a Grandmaster. But anyway, Think Like a Grandmaster. Wouldn't you like to th think like a Grandmaster? Well, I'm trying to treat trying to teach you to think like a master here, but I want to point out a couple things he ma makes, uh, points he makes in that book. He's talking about candidate moves. And just to use this particular position for an illustration, the way uh, Kotov explains it, uh, White has this position. We'll just substitute whatever position Kotov had. Actually, he didn't have a position. He just gave moves. Let's just say you're in a position and you're trying to decide between... Uh, a couple of moves. Is it going to be g5 or h3? And you're looking at g5 and you're, you're getting uh, involved in it and it looks promising but you're not quite sure. Then you switch over to h3 and you like that, then you don't like it. Then you go back to g4 and you look at that and you're still not happy. And you finally go back to h3 as a candidate move and you're still not happy. And then finally what you do is you say, ah, I can play knight b5 here and you play it. And your game rapidly falls apart. And as Kotov told the story, the audience just roared in laughter because they'd all been in that position before and done exactly what Kotov said. So knight b5, obviously it's a silly move, but I just did it here to illustrate the point. Well, black's going to win a pawn now. But uh, how often do you do that? You play a move on impulse and you can't do that. Okay, so uh, what else do I have about this position? and about tactics and impulsivity. There's, like I say, there's a lot of reasons for it. And what I'm going to do is go find a game here in my library that I loaded up. And this game is just loaded with um, impulsive moves. And I'll give you the backstory on this game. I named him Rising Junior, and that's exactly what he was. This was a weekend tournament. It was held... Uh, back in 1979, if you rec 
recall my uh, lesson one, I gave my chess biography and what years I was reaching certain rating classes. And here at this time, I had a published rating of 1860, and I think he was about 2000 something. But uh, there, 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 during this time, the USCF had some major problems, and they had to change computers. And you know, computers weren't such a big thing back then, but the rating system was on a computer. And the ratings got frozen for, gosh, I don't remember, nine months, something like that. They couldn't update anyone's rating. So I had this 1860 rating, and, and I was rapidly improving. Uh, I was doing quite well in a lot of events, going up in points. And uh, when they finally caught up uh, shortly after this event was played, I, I ended up with a rating of 2050, my first uh, expert rating. But kind of like the last lesson when I said I was unpublished 21 something, here I was unpublished 2050, but I wasn't playing yet uh, at 2050 skill because I'd never been published there, and I wasn't uh, in turn beating the lower players that I needed to beat to prove that I could stay at 2050. So although my rating was going up, uh, up and I was playing expert chess, I wasn't really there yet. And when you see this game, you're going to wonder how I even got that high. But, oh well, uh, like I say, it's, uh, it's, it's a great example, and, I'll, and I'm happy to share this with you. Uh, what else about this? Okay, it was a small weekend event. I can't remember all the details. Maybe 25, 30 players were entered. Uh, in round one, I had to play board one. Someone rated like 2131, and, and I lost that. But I found myself in the last round with a three and two score and playing this fellow, and it was like a forced pairing. He was actually leading the tournament, and uh, he had played everybody else that was close that had a reasonable score, so they had to pair him with me. And I, I didn't mind. I have to play somebody. And... Uh, so if he beats me, he's going to win the tournament. And in in my case, uh, there's an under two thousand prize of sixty dollars. It's not much, uh, at least today. Today that'll fill up a midsize uh, car with with fuel. Back then, it would fill that car up with fuel and let you have enough money to go on a date and have dinner. Dinner. So my half times have changed. But anyway, for for what it's worth, sixty bucks is sixty bucks. So there's something to play for here. Uh, I had some competition for the prize. There was one other uh, under 2,000 player with the same score as I, and he was playing another expert in the event. Uh, they were sitting right next to me, so I could watch that game unfold. And the worst case scenario would be if uh, if we if we both won, I'd have to split the prize, and that's thirty dollars, which is still a reasonable prize. That's dinner for two. <laughs> okay, so anyway. Uh, the player that I lost to in round one was only a half a point behind Mr. Rising Jr. here, and he won his game, so he's all prepped to win first. I can't remember what first prize was, 120, 150, whatever. But uh, unfortunately, I'm you know I'm giving it away. I, I ended up losing this, and y y you're really going to be shocked by <laughs> by what happened. But but it'll really teach you a lot. Uh, all the impulsive moves I made and and weak tactical decisions and then then again there's some kind of surprising moves in here it wasn't it wasn't a total loss of a game it's very interesting and uh, back when I made lesson 005 I gave everyone an opening repertoire what to play and I suggested what to play against the French I didn't want to go into too much detail about this other sideline I have, but here's one you can you can adopt if you're not happy with the variations I suggested to play against the French. It's called uh, the Chagorin variation against the French, and it's Queen E2. And I pretty much abandoned it after a while. It didn't get me that uh, much success. Uh, ran into a lot of trouble. Usually what happens, the strategies Black does at some point is put puts his bishop on e7 and, and gets an early d5 in and equalizes quite easily. Uh, but the strategy for, for white is to now play this like a King's Indian attack and you'll see that unfold as it goes. So this might be something you, you might want to play against the uh, French defense. So this game will give you some kind of an idea. That's kind of like a funny Sicilian defense. 
right? My queen's on e2 and my knight's not on f3. Okay, so I just continue with uh, my king's Indian attack motive. Now he wants to drop a knight in on d4. And there's that bishop e7 that I discussed that's just coming. And now I just continue. It, it's logical to fianchetto that bishop because you've parked the queen on, on e2 and you don't really have a good square for it to go yet. So this, this continuation is all kind of logical. If you dig up uh, Mikhail Chigorin's old games, and they should be available somewhere, you might find a number of his games where he played it. You could look at those if you have time. See how he treated it. Okay, so now uh, just logically go through the follow-up. I'm preparing my King's Indian formation. Get my king side pieces developed. My queen side's still behind, but so is his. And he gives a check. And I, I, I don't quite understand that, but I'm not here to talk about candidate moves and this, that's, and the other things just yet. But it kind of lets me do some of the things I want to do. Uh, I want to play c3 in a lot of these variations and support the uh, the center maybe with an eventual d4 or just to keep his knight out. Uh, Okay, so we just go on a little bit. Now he plays uh, queen b6. This is kind of an interesting move. It has some indirect pressure on on uh, b2. So naturally I might want to play bishop e3 at some point, but he might be kicking it with knight g4. Uh, so I kind of follow up the, with a logical move here. I play king h1. This way if I plan bishop e3, the idea will be if it gets kicked to come back to, to g1. Okay, so, but I don't do that. Don't know why I didn't do that. It's just something that came up to, came to mind now. And I really question this move, knight g5, although it has, uh, has some points to it. And it, I guess it's one of those impulsive moves uh, that I'm talking about, because logically what I need to do and what I've always said I need to do is continue with my development, and nothing is wrong at all with bishop e3. Again, if he plays knight g4, I just drop the bishop back and uh, continue about my way. And uh, I do have to worry about b2 at some point, I can't unless I can work out some kind of a sacrifice where he, he takes it, but I get all kinds of pressure in, in, in return, you know, rook, rook b1 and takes on b7. But we can work on all that all that as we go. So knight g5 is is one of those impulsive moves, but it worked out. He didn't play it well. Probably the logical thing for him to do is maybe either exchange center pawns and then just uh, centralize one of his rooks or try to improve the position of his one of his bishops or something. I don't know. But, uh, you know, he took, and now he allows the, me to show the point of, uh, of uh, knight g5. So sometimes you can play an impulsive move and, and get away with it, but the stronger your opponent, the less likely that's going to happen. I can't stress that, so en stress that enough. Uh, when you're high rated, they're going to make fewer mistakes. Uh, when they're, as their rating drops, they're going to start making more, but... You still you don't, you can't count on when your opponent's going to make that mistake. So an impulsive move most likely is going to get yourself punished. I mean, here I am sitting with this entire queen side undeveloped, and I'm carrying on an attack with one piece because really, are my bishop and queen ready to help? No, they're not. Uh, the rook is kind of ready if I get f5 in, but that's still a ways away. But now I show the point of uh, of my knight g5. Now I'm happy if he t if he takes because then I uh, take his knight. So let's just look at it real quick. And you'll see the the point. What's he going to do? He's got to take back, I guess. Which way which way is he going to take back? If he takes with the pawn, uh, I've got targets. If he takes with the bishop, I just take this pawn and tempo his bishop out of there, and I'm getting some some lines open up. So, but taking with the pawn might be as even if it's his best choice, it just seems to be running into disaster. All of a sudden, I've got moves like queen h5. Uh, ouch, you know, there's all kinds of possibilities for me here. So, uh, let's just go back to the main line. So he, he saw that and doesn't fall further into my impulsivity because I don't think h6 was the proper move. He should have 
done something in the center. But anyway, knight d5. And now my knight's happily posted on e4. I've got a better square for it. And he's got uh, a minor weakness on the king side. And we'll see what happens. Okay, so I got away with my first impulsive move. But then again, I'm I'm only threatening to be an expert strength. So I'm, I'm not there yet. I can't play these things perfectly or close to it. Okay, so f6. Uh, this just seems to give me some chances for some tactics if the board opens up, but I still have to consider this horrible uh, arrangement over there on the queen side. But I take here, and now I've got a target, backward pawn on the open file, so you could argue white's a little better here. Now I finally make a sensible move instead of uh, taking on f6 at this moment and improving the position of his pieces, I let him have the exchange on e4 and I'll improve the position of my pieces. Okay, so he doesn't bite bite on that, but now I go ahead and and make the trade and he takes with the bishop and then the knight hops in and I'm wanting to get the bishop pair if I can for what it's worth and I think it's right here he made a made a goof. Yeah, e5. So white to play and do the best he can. And the continuation is it, over the next several moves is kind of tactical, and I start finding the right moves at least for now. Okay, first first I stop and give a check. Okay, and you can see that c5 is hanging. Uh, okay, bishop e6. Now I take the pawn. So I've won a pawn. Um, for what it's worth, that could be enough to be playing uh, to to get a win once we uh, the position further clarifies winning a pawn is winning a pawn what does he have to show for it well really he doesn't have anything okay so he uh, ignored the queen exchange he doesn't want to bring my knight into c5 it's a pretty pretty good square for it I do have to watch this uh, rook on f1 although uh, my bishop doesn't need to move anywhere right now, but at some point it might want to uh, come to d5 or c6. So I have to be careful because I don't have my back rank uh, cleared yet. I've still got that ugly bishop sitting on c1. I've talked about it in many, many games. How often do you see the queen rook and queen bishop sitting there on their original squares forever? Here we are at move 20, and I'm up a pawn, but I've given him odds of a rook and a bishop to do it, and he's ahead in development. So, anyway, here we go. A3. Oh, just horrible, horrible, horrible. I forgot that I played that here. Uh, <laughs> okay, what does A3 do? Well, it's an impulsive move. Why did I play it? Okay, again, I saw something, and I reacted. I said, well, at some point, he's going to want to take that pawn, and... I need to move it, but I don't need to move it. Okay, first off, my rook isn't going anywhere on on a1. It's not the the back rank isn't clear. But even if he even if he does take it, when my uh, if I just stop and move my bishop, let's just give that as a as an example. Is he really going to take it and step into a pin? Eh, probably not. Okay, I I can sure I can find some good moves here. Uh, to eventually uh, win that. Let's see. What's wrong with check? Okay. How's he going to take? Take with the rook? Okay. Check. What's he going to do? <laughs> if he take, or oh, he gets a check. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Because I get a check. And then his queen falls. So, any common sense and careful analysis, I'll realize he can't take that pawn. So, why am I playing a3? Like I said, it's an impulsive move. And it just kind of messes me up. It just does so many things. Uh, it invites him to come into b3, uh, and even then, how's he going to do it? Knight a5? Yeah, then knight b3, and the pawn's pinned, but I've got time to, to work around that, I guess. So, just a3, horrible, horrible, horrible. And I did it. I admit it. But it doesn't cost me the game. Okay, there's plenty more to happen. I, I, I have a whole bunch of great uh, impulsive moves here to uh, criticize, criticize myself with. Okay, so knight a5. Now he's threatening a fork. Whoops. Got to be careful. Okay. Knight b3 is a threat. So 
like I said, the game goes into a tactical mode of here really quick. Okay, knight b3. And there's the tactics coming. Okay, so it's kind of an easy move to see. I say, well, if you trade knights, uh, I've eliminated the, the attack on my rook, and I'm still up a pawn. So he took here. Now we're on each other's queens. Now I have a temporary queen sacrifice. Now he takes here. Obviously, if he takes back on e6, I can drop bishop into d5. So right now I'm behind material. I'm down the exchange, but that's not uh, going to last. And here, material is even, but black's got some serious problems. Uh, first off, white's got its choice of two pawns to capture, and the black knight on a1 is in serious trouble. How's he going to get out of there? Right? How's that knight going to get out of there? It's not that clear how that knight does get out of there, because he can't play knight b3, because if he plays knight b3, I have a check, and the, the check just picks it up, right? So I'm threatening this knight. I'm threatening on uh, b7. Black's got serious issues here. I've got the bishop pair. Uh, white can look at this and just under the principle of two weaknesses and saying I'm winning. Uh, I'm up a pawn. I've got the two bishops. That's two uh, two weaknesses in the black camp. And then the knight's, the knight's lost. How could I lose this game? Well, I found all kinds of great ways to do it through, impu in, through impulsive moves. Okay, so knight c2, and like I said, I played impulsively and wasn't careful and didn't think. Uh, white to play and do the best he can. How are you going to win that knight? Pause the video. Okay, you should have paused the video or re restarted and solved this. It's pretty easy to see how to win that knight. I can look at this and say, gee, that's easy. What is what does uh, what does Black do against Bishop e4? I don't know what he does. I think he resigns. The knight's gone. What wh where's it go? It can he can gobble a couple pawns for it, I guess. Let's see. Because look, can't go to b4, can't go to d4, can't go to e3. Well, he could go to e3, but uh, I have ways around it. The, the idea is Bishop takes e3 and he plays rook e8. Uh, hitting both bishops, but I just have a tempo check to get out of it and then safeguard the other bishop. So really, the, the, all the knight can do is take on a3, and then he can grab this pawn, but hey, I just take this pawn, and what's black do? Black's busted. It's that simple. So I played impulsively and didn't think and said, the knight's gone. I have, I can win it, and I played the the worst of the two moves, rook c1. Again, the knight had no move, but I didn't think. I played in on impulse, and now black to play and do the best he can. Here's another quiz for you. Solve it. How do you save the 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 the, the day here? Okay, you should resume the video, and here's the move, rook d8. And look, it's silly. If I play rook takes knight, I've got to give back the uh, the piece, right? Rook takes. And then check. I mean, this is so obvious. I don't know how I, <laughs> I missed it, other than just playing on impulse. And White's okay here. He shouldn't lose. But he's got to grind out the win. So let's see what happened. So I played here. Now, I've, now I'm threatening the knight again. But watch what he can do. G5. Now my bishop is kind of stuck. Where, where am I going to put that bishop? Uh, it can't go back on the diagonal. I took c1 away from myself. Uh, I, I only have one place to put that bishop. Or go into a bishop of opposite color ending. So I played it to c7. And now he's on it again. So I go to b8. At least I have a threat here. But now look, the knight got out, and it's all my fault. But I'm still winning, right? Right? Yeah, I'm still winning. Uh, I'm two pawns up. It's uh, just a routine. But like I say, I played impulsively this game, and I think this is the point where I did another one. 
White to play and do the worst he can without directly hanging a piece. Okay, here I'll show it to you. After you stop the video, maybe you want to look at what, what kind of howler I can play. I've got a, I guess I want to hold on to B2. That's what he's attacking. So that's what I did. If I'm in, whoop, not yet. I I think it's next move. Okay, I attacked his, attacked his rook first. Now I do it. Rook C2. Just bleh. Rook B1, if anything. Um, I don't know. Anyway. Now all of a sudden, I've got some things i got to watch out for. Now my bishop is getting close to being trapped. Uh, what do I do? Maybe there's a way out of it. I'm not going to stop and look at it. Like bishop b8 and rook b7. Ooh, then I get bishop checks. But he's trying desperately to do anything, and I'm forcing him to find good moves because I keep threatening to win the game on him. So I came over here, and I relying on the tactic that if he, he takes my bishop I regain the knight and instead he just starts getting this uh, active game against my king he's forget about the piece he doesn't want the piece maybe he can checkmate me ouch <laughs> and you know it's funny is white still winning this I just kept making impulsive moves now you got to be careful what's the threat well the threat is g4 check and what does white do? Okay, let's just spend a move. Okay, check. What do I do? I have one legal move. And there it is. And I got mated. Oops. Okay, so black has a serious threat here. Uh, I got to deal with it. At some point, what I needed to do was play bishop e6 check. If not now, uh, in the next series of moves. And that would have been enough. But I play g4 now. And uh, black to play. And he comes up with rook g1. Now he's got more threats that I've got to be careful about. Okay. What's uh, what's white do here? White's got to be, be very, very, very careful. And the key move is bishop e6 check. But instead I... Uh, found a lemon I found bishop takes b6 an impulsive move okay why well look three connected pass pawns right but if I check first then I have uh, uh, I can keep that piece and now all of a sudden let's see let me just use the arrow I think it's knight f4 oh yeah okay now all of a sudden look at this position White's got some serious trouble here. And I guess this is the point where I woke up. And I remember the spectators were kind of gathered around the board watching me struggle in my embarrassment. Uh, what do you do here with White? It's, it's just not easy. Uh, a lot of people said they would have resigned in this position. And instead I found a, a resource and they were complimenting me on it. White to play and do the best he can. What do you do? You can't take the you can't take the knight with the pawn, you get mated. You can't take the knight with the rook, you get mated. What do you do? Well, pause the video. Okay, what'd you come up with? Uh I was just sitting here looking at this for the first time really. I'm wondering about rook g two. That's not the move I played, but I'm just wondering about rook g two here. Uh I guess if push comes to shove he can uh just play pawn takes check and go from there. Let's see. That might have been a good move. I don't know. But the move I found was, I, I was wondering how many people would see it. Here it is. Rook f4. Guards g4 and attacks his rook. And a lot of people are just surprised by that move that didn't even consider the possibility. And, and if you found it, good job. Uh, it defends everything nicely. I guess it could transpose uh, let's see. What does he do? Yeah, he does that. Okay, so let's just assume that I had played rook g2. Okay. And then I have to take back with the rook. Right? So I guess the position transposes. Okay, so rook f4 takes. I have to take with the rook. Yeah, so, so if I had played rook g2, it would have just transposed into this. And let's see how black handles this position. But neat. But you see what's happened? I've dropped my I've dropped a piece. I'm down a piece now. I've got all kinds of pawns for it. But 
you know, it's just a disaster. I, I didn't have to be in this situation. Okay, anyway. I tend to fall apart here really quick. You know, I've got past pawns. I've got to use them. Again, it's probably just an impulsive choice. Check. He starts checking me a little bit. Oh, I mentioned earlier about the game next to me. The, the guy I was in competition for, for the prize. At some point, uh, early, he built up an advantage and his game finished ahead of mine. He won, so the best I could do was was uh, uh, tie for the prize and with a win. But So playing for a draw doesn't really matter to me. I don't really care anything. I'll try anything and try to win this. Uh, naturally, a few other people were not too happy with my result, particularly the guy that uh, was expecting to win this tournament because I was going to beat this guy, but sorry. Yeah, well, I, I didn't win a prize either. I'm sorry it took one from you, but anyway. So we kind of start going back and forth a little bit and finally decides he doesn't want to draw. He's going to play for the win. And I just go a few more moves and then disaster strikes again. Okay, ouch, that knight's getting strong. <laughs> and then check and I pretty much realize the uh, writing is on the wall white's gonna lose this in just about every uh, scenario there's nothing I can really do here and so I chose to resign so not a perfect game uh, definitely not uh, expert strength at certain points of the game yes I played them well uh, I did find some some good moves along with all the bad moves but the lesson there was when you when you're just reacting and not going through candidate moves, you can have all kinds of bad things happen to you. Okay, uh, as a postscript to this, I'll show you another game. I actually played this uh, gentleman again just ooh, two and a half years later. This was played about uh, three months after the games in Lesson 007. And I I'll just run through the game. I certainly had a great chance to exact revenge. And I played G3 on move one, and there's a whole other story about me using G3, which I'll show you in a upcoming lesson. But one of the things about G3, which I mentioned in Lesson 005, it's one of those moves that can transpose into a lot of different openings. And this one actually transposes into, well, let's see if you can figure it out. I know what it is. Let's see if you can see it coming. Okay. You know what that position is? You should. If not, no big deal. Maybe you don't play this low line. It's the Tarash defense to the uh, Queen's Gambit declined. Okay. And I actually had spent a little time on this uh, opening. I had prepared a number of ways with both white and black. So I wasn't completely unfamiliar with it. Uh, I can't remember if if uh, this follow how long this follows book there's a little tactic that I do and have had happen to me too so uh, doesn't really get me much but you'll see it when it comes okay here's the tactic okay knight takes c4 the point being that you're sacrificing the piece only temporarily you're going to get a, a fork back but it comes at a price black gets the bishop pair but I don't know what theory was or is on this today and that's not important just gonna entertain you with another game uh, is my chance for revenge. And now look, look at his rating, 23-21. So in two and a half years, he's moved right up. Uh, there's my fork. And I get my piece back. Uh, but actually, he ended up getting the better game and was probably close to winning uh, here real quick. I don't remember everything until I go over it. Let's see. Okay, queen a5. And I just gobble my pawn, so I'm a pawn up, but I really can't hold it. He's got a lot of uh, acti activity here. His pieces are all actively posted. Look look at those bishops. They're just raking, raking across the board. Look at that. Okay. His rooks are both on open files, uh, attacking pawns, and his queen is covering the entire uh, his entire fourth rank, my fifth rank, and he's on that diagonal, and he's keeping an eye on that knight. So black's got a pretty active game here. White's pieces are kind of discombobulated a little bit, meaning they're just not working together. But I got a pawn, so let's see what happens. Okay, now 
Taco Attack upon. Why not, huh? And he decided to give it to me. And I'm pretty sure he's close to winning now. Uh, yeah, there it is. Okay. And I've got to step very carefully here. And so I just grab that. And yeah, White White's definitely losing this. But he, did, he didn't play it right and give me a golden opportunity. Now I'm threatened to take on c8 okay and at some point in here I'm pretty sure the game is is a forced draw we might be there now I don't remember uh, yeah I'm at this point I have a forced draw if I want it I don't have to take that but I'm playing for a win okay I can just retreat the bishop back and s start checking him with the queen okay I think bishop f5 is fine and and then check on h7 and h8. When he comes back to e7, I have a check on e4, and I think it's risky for him to shove his pawn. Well, no, I have to get rid of that bishop first, but that's some of the themes. Okay. But here, I'm sure I still have uh, at least a draw. And this move is fine. Uh, pick up a pawn while I'm at it. Check. And... Now I have uh, two pawns for the exchange, so I've got some compensation here. And he does what he can. Uh, now he's attacking my rook, and just to show you how active the black pieces are, where's my rook go? He really only has one square, even though the whole most of the whole first rank is open. I've got to go all the way back to f1 where, well, I checked first. I've got to go all the way back to f1 with it, and... Uh, where it's not really helping me. Well, it wasn't helping on helping me on a1 either. But I'm just attacking with two pieces here. Yet I'm still okay. And at least right here, yeah, this is where he made the losing move. And I guess I'm trying to remember everything about this. I was thinking about this game and why I ended up losing this with White, even though I'm I'm winning from this position. This club. Uh, held a lot of tournaments on weekends and then they had a regular club meeting there too but their weekend tournaments always had time controls of 40 moves in two hours always there was nef nothing other than that and then secondary time control I think was 25 moves in one hour and here we are at move 31 so there's only nine moves to go for time control right now I can't remember how much time I had left I didn't mark it on the score sheet but I probably had 20, 30 minutes left. I don't know. Not important. But uh, I can't remember exactly how I found out. But right about this time, I found out that the, the tournament director had changed the time control to 50 moves in two hours. And it, this was unheard of because all, the Turk, all these uh, events always were uh, 40 and 2. And why do you want to do that? And he said, well, I have to go somewhere tonight, and I want this round to be over with, so I shortened the time control, made, made things happen. And I grumbled and complained. I said, no, you can't change the time control. He goes, I'm the tournament director, and I wasn't going to argue with him because I'm in a game, and now I have to come back to the board and play quick. And they... Uh, White to play and do the best he can. It's uh, White's dead winning. What what do you do? Stop the video. Have a look. Well, if you if you've resumed the video, you should have found the blatantly obvious move. Bishop takes f7 check. What's he do? Uh, he's got to take it because if he doesn't take it, he's going to take it next move because his only other. Well, let's see. No, he, he can't play king here because then I have rook check, and anyway. King takes and queen takes, and look, he's he's lost. He's he's down three pawns. He's got no compensation for it. His king's exposed. His only uh, glimmer of hope, at least for the moment, is my rook is deactivated. But that's that's going to change. Uh, <laughs> anyway, white uh, white wins. Don't even have to think about playing impulsively here. This will practically play itself. The black king is in such bad bad shape. But anyway, I didn't see it. I didn't even see it right away. Um, looking at it later, I saw it and groaned. But I did the best I could, at least the best I could see, and things just didn't work out. And the game went on 
know oh, about another 10 moves showing you those 10 moves are really not important I, I have three pawns for the rook but that's not enough and and I lost the game but it's kind of interesting uh, I can play well against strong players I certainly played as well as I could here I, although we both had our moments of oops before I missed the uh, the bishop takes f7 check he had made his mistake and I had made mine before so the game kind of went his favor, my favor, and then his favor again. And in between, I could have uh, forced a draw. Uh, but, you know, I played I played okay. I'm, I can't complain. I didn't win, but you're not going to win all your games. You're, you're going to lose winning games. Everyone's in that boat. Everyone can, can sympathize or empathize with this because that's what you do. All we can do is try to discover why we do these things and seek to avoid them happening again even though they're going to happen again at least if we can make them happen uh, fewer times that's all the better and in, in my own case I have quite a few of these that got away against stronger players and it's not because I wasn't uh, a good player I was I was getting these positions against them part of it was because uh, I just didn't have the the full strength built up I mean in, in the previous game, game number one, I, I, I was playing expert level chess, but I wasn't yet an expert. And in this game, uh, is just when I got my master rating. So now I was trying to justify that I that I had the master rating and for a reason. And things things go up, things go down. But when you're playing tougher players, doesn't matter what level you're at. If you're up higher like we were here or down lower wherever you are, 1900 to 2100, you know, you're know, 19 playing 2050 to 2100, or you're 1600 playing 1750 to 1850, you've got them on the ropes and there's a reason uh, or reasons why you don't finish them off, we can try and uncover them. And, and since my own weakness is, uh, one of my own weaknesses is, is the impulsivity, uh, my student told me about it, and I see other people doing it. I, th I think it's uh, one of those common weaknesses. And how to, how to get around it? Well, let's just refresh. What do we say? How do we get around it? Well, we take our time. That's one way. If we got time on the clock, we burn it. The other way is through candidate moves. you got to make sure you're looking at candidate moves. Uh, I can remember a lot about my old games. And a lot of the circumstances uh, that were going on at the time, like I explained in, in these two games, I remembered so much, but I can't remember exactly like what candidate moves did I look at. A lot of times maybe I was just playing playing by impulse. Uh, whatever move I looked at first, I put more stress on that, satisfied myself that if he does what I want him to do, I'm doing fine. and. Then he proves to show me he has things I didn't even consider because I just didn't analyze the position carefully. Uh, tactics, you can learn tactics, as I said, through going over your own games, uh, the, all the other tactics to, at your disposal. I mean, there's no excuse for me not missing bishop takes f7 check. I don't know. Uh, I guess maybe I was just irritated because the tournament director had changed the time control, but I'm not blaming him. I know that did have an effect, but it's not an excuse. Anyone can see bishop takes f7 check. <laughs> you know, just the fact that I'm, I'm 2200 published and, and I don't see a move like that. You know, anyway, we all we all have moments like that. We're, we're all going to continue to. So, ideally, what this, hopefully, this lesson does for you is it uh, gets you to, to look at your own weaknesses again. And if if you are an impulsive player, and I think we all are at some point in our game or whatever. Think about it. What are you doing impulsively that's wrong? And and I've come up with some uh, solutions. There may be more. I'm sure I'll think of some uh, when I go back over all my old games uh, to present the future lessons. So they say I have hundreds of these things. Uh, I can look at a score sheet and, oh, yeah, I remember that game. And let's see what happened. And then I can say, yeah, I know... Um, uh, exactly what I can sh share from that from that game and how I can uh, uh, put it into a lesson and I was giving a private student a lesson on minor piece endings and bishop versus knight was the topic and I knew exactly uh, which games I played when, when they were played and where to find and where to find them so that I could drag out some bishop and knight endings to give them a good illustration of how these things are handled 
and so I know where to find this stuff. I can find it pretty easily. I have a uh, pretty good memory on a lot of things, uh, and this is a progressive course. You don't learn everything at once. Uh, you just keep following the lessons one by one. Uh, absorb what you can. Get out. Play your game. Study your game after. Got to remind some of you guys that you, you're playing a standard game. Are you tearing it to shreds like I explained? Not moving on and, until you're satisfied that you had a playable game with, a, with your better move? When you're playing your correspondence games, are you taking those up to three hours per move or are you playing impulsively? Uh, one of my students told me today about a postal game he just finished and I looked at it and ouch, <laughs> he did what I did in game one here. He, he got a completely winning game and made impulsive moves and suddenly the opponent, opponent's position got better and better and an attack came and ouch. So uh, that's what you got to do. You got to you got to correct these uh, deficiencies in your playing style. If you're if you're playing impulsively, you got to slow down and be more careful. Uh, take your time. If you've got the time, take it. Okay. Uh, I think I think this is going to be very helpful. I'm really interested in what kind of feedback I get from you all all on this. Uh, I want to get some of these out a little quicker than normal. Uh, for a lot of reasons, I do know a number of people are ready. <laughs> as soon as they see one of them, they're ready for another one. And I, I, originally, my plan was to put them out once a week, and then have a, a live session where I, we talked about them. But that didn't work, and instead, I'm just happy to let you guys work on your time while I work on my time, and uh, I'll just keep them coming. And Again, some people are going to discover this course one month from now, six months from now, and they may have 10, 20, 50, 100 lessons waiting to be seen. Uh, they're there for them. They just start working on them and catch up, okay? So don't feel bad if, if you're still back on lesson two or three and you see that I've got now eight of them posted. You'll, you'll get there. I uh, will try not to make you, make, make you wait more than a week. Uh, for any of the lessons. I kind of want to get a little ahead of the game in case I do have to take some time off. I'm, Like I said briefly at the end of the last lesson, I'm trying to take a summer job that will take me out of state and I'll need a laptop for that. And I'm not sure if I can swing affording that on my own yet. I've got my donation up on my Blogspot website. Got another $20 today. Thank you so much. You know who you are. I don't know if I'll make it, but I'll give it my best shot. And one way or the other, these even if I do go back there, I'll find some way to keep the lessons going, no matter what happens. Again, this is my pleasure to do this for you. Uh, you're gaining, and I'm gaining. So, uh, with that in mind, I'll start planning a lesson for 009. Not sure exactly where it's going yet. I got a few ideas that I've been saving, and Sometimes the feedback I get from you guys helps influence which one comes next. So let's see what kind of comments again. And lastly, I wish to thank all of you so much for taking the time to look at this. Thanks again. Bye now.